Hello, everybody. Thank you, uh, Terry. And it's a pleasure today uh, to have Dr. Judith Cook, who's a professor of psychiatry at the University of Chicago and is really a national leader in doing research applications uh, around the peer movement and community-based care. I've admired her work since I read her study of the Wellness Recovery Action Plan about a decade ago, and it's a great honor to have her with us. She's gonna review the work she has created with her team to create a solution suite that you can use uh, in the service of your recovery. And uh, at the end, I'm gonna take all your questions and we'll have a conversation. Uh, Dr. Judith Cook, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for all you do and take it away. Thank you so much, Ken. And thank you all for joining me today. Um, I'm going to turn off my camera in order to preserve as much bandwidth as I can, um, but I will come back on for the um, questions and answers a little bit later on in today's presentation. Before getting underway, I'd like to acknowledge our funding as a Rehabilitation Research and Training Center from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research and also SAMHSA's financial contribution to our center. Today's presentation does not represent the policy of or endorsement by any agency of the federal government, and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose in regard to the material that I will be presenting today. Sorry about that. Today, I'm gonna to be focusing on our center solution suite, which is a free set of products designed for use with and by people in recovery from mental health and substance use disorders. We designed it with Microsoft's Office Suite in mind. Most of you are probably familiar with Office Suite's products, including Microsoft Word, Excel Spreadsheet, PowerPoint, which I'm using for today's presentation, and Outlook. The idea here is that each component serves a different purpose, but is compatible with other programs in the package. And the same is true with our solution suite, as you'll learn today. The framework we used in designing the suite is based on what we heard from the field in our 30 years of operating a rehabilitation research and training center. First, the suite's products are available for free. That's very important. Most programs or many programs don't have the ability to spend money in order to purchase interventions and manuals. Also, the products are designed to be delivered at minimal cost, another very important thing. They are all rehabilitation and recovery oriented, and they address goals that people with lived experience have told us they value. The tools can be used with minimal to moderate training, and that training is also provided in the suite in the form of a podcast and a webinar that cover how to deliver it or use it or teach it. Suite products are designed to complement traditional behavioral health treatment, such as psychotherapy, medication, case management, and addictions treatment. The products are supported by research and evaluation studies, and some are evidence-based practices, such as supported employment and RAP. All the products were designed by us and our center's collaborators to respond to documented needs of service recipients and also community providers. One special feature of the suite is that all of its products are supported by free technical assistance which is delivered by my center via telephone and email. And finally, many of these products can be delivered by peers if they view the training webinar, and in some cases, if they have experience leading groups or working with people individually. We developed the suite with our partners, Dr. Peggy Swarbrick and Pat Nemec, whom I'm sure many of you know, from Collaborative Support Programs of New Jersey, a large peer-run organization. Solution Suite products are grouped into two categories, 
tools that integrate health and behavioral health care, and tools that promote self-directed recovery. Here's a page from the Solution Suite website listing the 10 products that integrate behavioral health and primary care. I know you can't read the titles. This is just to show you what it looks like when you go there on the web. I'll say more about each of these in a moment. And here's the look at the page showing the eight products that promote self-direction in behavioral health treatment. I'll also be covering all of these today. Each product is presented in the same format. And it's good to know this because um, what we try to do in the landing page, and we're looking at a landing page right now for our weight management curriculum, it's good to know that all this information will be there if you are first learning about a tool and thinking about using it. So this is the landing page for the weight management curriculum, and I'll talk more about the curriculum in a moment. But starting with the left-hand panel at the top of the page, you'll see a picture of the product itself, which you click on to download. I get lots of questions about this. Where can I download it? You just click on the picture of the product and it will download. Then to the right of that picture, and scrolling down, we present information, starting with what is the program, which offers a brief description of the product. Next is who can use it. This section describes who the product is designed for. After that comes a section called how does it work? This section describes what the active ingredients and change mechanisms of the project are. And I'll say a little bit more about that later in today's presentation. Moving now to the right-hand panel of the slide, what resources are needed, tells you the resources required to use or teach the product. Finally, what experience is needed, describes the expertise and experiences required by people who wanna teach or deliver the product. If you scroll down further, you'll see three boxes. The one on the left is a red microphone. If you click on this, you'll listen to a podcast about the product and how it's being used in the field. To the right of that is a blue box. This links to an audio webinar with slides that teaches you how to deliver the product or use it with others. And in some cases, how to use the project for yourself, depending on its nature. Some are, are products that you can use alone by yourself and others are classes and still others are implementation manuals. I'll say more about that in a moment. All the podcasts and webinars have transcripts for those with hearing challenges. Finally, at the bottom of the page is that all important red oblong box, which you can click on to request free technical assistance on using and implementing it in your program or service system. One focus of the suite is on addressing the different areas of people's lives that are so important to recovery from a mental health or substance use disorder. And one very popular product in the suite that addresses this is a workbook called Wellness in Eight Dimensions. It introduces people to the idea that wellness is much broader than just mental health and includes seven other dimensions that make up the eight dimensions of wellness. These other dimensions include financial wellness, which involves being able to manage one's personal finances and feeling financially secure. Social wellness, which includes having relationships with family, friends, and the community, and having an interest in and concern for the needs of others. Spiritual wellness, which includes not only organized worship, but also having meaning and purpose in one's life and living according to values and principles. Another dimension is environmental wellness, which encompasses residential quality, the physical safety of one's dwelling and neighborhood, and the atmosphere in the surrounding community. The following two dimensions are physical wellness, which includes the maintenance of a healthy body, good nutrition and exercise, and obtaining appropriate health care. And finally, there's intellectual wellness, which includes both formal education and informal lifelong learning. 
After brief introductions to each of the eight dimensions, shown by a page from the manual on the left-hand side of your screen, people consider what strengths they already have in each dimension. Then they complete a brief self-assessment of things they could do and maybe already are doing to maintain their wellness in that area. Based on that self-assessment, they write down any things that they would like to add to their lives to enhance their wellness on that dimension. And after that, they note what supports or help they might need in order to do those things. All of this information feeds into the creation of a daily wellness plan shown on the right, laying out what people would like to do each day of the week to work on the wellness dimensions that matter to them. And here it's important to note that some people do a wellness daily plan that includes the social dimension and the occupational. Some are only interested in the intellectual. Um, so it's really up to the individual what area or areas of wellness they wanna concentrate on. This is a very simple tool. And interestingly enough, it's one of our most popular ones. It can be used in a group setting or done with a therapist, family member, peer, or other supporter. And again, there's a podcast about it, a webinar on how to use or deliver it to other people, and free technical assistance for people who want to implement it. I mentioned financial wellness, which involves having access to adequate income, knowledge and skills to manage personal finances, and also the feeling of financial security. All of that is encompassed by financial wellness. And interestingly, it's a, a part of wellness that many people uh, with lived experience don't have. Research shows us that these factors are important to many people's recovery. So to address this need, the suite contains a product called Building Financial Wellness. This is a six session financial education curriculum with classes that start with introduction to basic financial concepts, use of personal reflection in defining one's own picture of fin financial wellness, because financial wellness is, is different for different people who are in different economic circumstances, different family situations, um, and maybe have different goals. Also, we teach use of standard money management tools to set and pursue any financial goals the person might happen might have. The primary focus of the classes is teaching people budgeting skills, while also helping them deal with their worries about money and feeling that they're unable to save money for valued purchases if they wish. We found that many people spend a lot of time worrying about money and that it can influence their mental health and sense of well being. Not everybody who uh, participates in the curriculum wants to save money, but there are ways for low income individuals to save for financial goals that really matter to them. So no one's forced to save, um, but people are helped to do so if they wish. This tool includes an instructor guide, which has a teacher script for each class, all the class materials, and how to prepare for each class. Also provided is a participant guide which includes all the handouts and exercises that culminate in the person's own action plan to reach a specific financial goal that has meaning for them. Here's one of my favorite parts of the manual. Um, it explains the difference between needs and wants. Needs are the things that we have to have in order to live a healthy, happy life. Basic resources such as food and shelter. Wants are the things we prefer to have, and we often spend money on them out of habit without thinking. You need food to survive and fuel your body, but you want a McDonald's meal or to eat out at a restaurant. You need clothing to cover your body and for modesty, but you want a pair of de designer jeans or the newest Nikes. When people learn to separate these, they often discover ways they can save money for things that really matter to them. So learning the difference between needs and wants, understanding that you may need coffee in the morning, but you want to get it at Starbucks. And if you made your own, figuring out how much you might save in a month, you start thinking about 
whether that might enable you over a period of months to take a trip to see your family that you wanted to do or to go to the beach. Participants also learn about financial services, such as setting up free banking, savings, and checking accounts. Banking is an important part of modern life, and a lot of folks in recovery don't have access to banking. Um, many people with low incomes don't have access to banking. This group is referred to as the unbanked, which I think is an interesting um, concept. What's important about this is that these individuals don't have a chance to build credit. They don't have an opportunity to use direct deposit. So in the curriculum, we help people set up free banking, savings and checkings accounts so that they can participate in this aspect of modern life. Finally, they learn about credit and debt and ways to improve their credit rating and pay off any loans that they might have. So that's a look at building financial wellness in the solution suite. And not another life area central to many people's recovery is employment. And the suite has multiple materials for people who are thinking about work, looking for services that will help them get and keep good jobs, and wanting to build careers. One of our most popular solution suite products is a booklet designed for people who are looking for services to help them work. It's called Seeking Supported Employment, and it educates users about what supported employment services actually involve and how supported employment can help them obtain a competitive job, which is a real job that belongs to them for real wages. Then the user is guided to visit employment programs in their local community, meet with a vocational staff person there, and ask a series of questions about the program's services and philosophy. What's important about these questions is that each asks about a service that research has shown helps people with serious mental health and substance use conditions get and keep competitive jobs. Here's a page from the manual showing some of the questions and the boxes people check as staff give their answers. They include questions such as, do people get placed in jobs that are permanent in your program? And can people get a job and also keep their SSI or SSDI benefits? And do people get jobs at minimum wage or above? These are all services delivered in evidence-based practice supported employment. And it's important to know whether those things are gonna be in the services that you receive. These answers are added up to allow the user to compute a score that summarizes the degree to which the program contains the active ingredients of evidence-based practice supported employment. If it gets the top score, users are told, this is an excellent program and you should consider getting services here. Or if it gets the lowest score, people are informed, this program lacks all or most services that will help you work competitively. So you might consider looking elsewhere or looking for work on your own. These questions can be asked of staff over the phone, but it's, we found that it's much better to go and visit the program and see what the environment is like um, and get a feel for it. The tool also helps guide people toward evidence-based practice vocational services, and it empowers them to look for services knowing that they've been shown to result in high quality employment. It's also been used with people who are just starting to think about working. Okay, I, I hear a little feedback, so I just want to make sure everybody's muted. Thank you. Um, it empowers them to look for services knowing that they've been shown to result in high quality employment, which is really important. You don't want services that are really not that effective in helping you get a competitive job. And it's also been used to um, uh, with people who are just starting to think about working and want to know what supported employment is and how it works. So I've been talking a lot, and you've been listening, which I appreciate, but I want to stop for a minute and see if there are any questions that people have, uh, particularly some basic questions either about how the suite works or maybe about one of the tools I've presented so far. Yeah, let me ask you a couple quick questions, Dr. Cook. Um, are you thinking that a program uh, uses this, and these program. This is a free suite of services. So, my local team 
gets it or can I as an individual access it or is it both? I mean, I know it's free to all, but is it like my nonprofit down the street does this for me or do I just find it on my own? That was my Excellent. first question. Excellent question. Many of the um, suites products are designed to use on your own. This is a really good example of one. So you could pick up seeking support and employment. You could find some vocational programs, get some from your local vocational rehabilitation um, authority and go and visit them and ask them these questions, add up the score and know I want to go to program X. I don't want to go to program Y. Um, this has also been used by people that lead vocational support groups, for example. So what they do is they um, uh, call different programs um, and report back to the other members in the group about what each program's score is. So that's an example of one that can be used in a variety of different ways. Uh, building financial wellness, you could read it, but it's mainly a, a curriculum of classes that you would teach. Um, but if you, you would teach or you would take? Both. So develop that idea. I've run across a few people who would not describe themselves as good with money. How might they <laughs> teach a class on money? Okay, that's a really good point, because some people that would like to, to teach some of the solution suite pro, um, programs say to themselves, well, I'm not an expert on financial education, so I couldn't teach that. And here's what's important to know about the suite. You're responsible if you teach or, or use the materials with other people, you're responsible for knowing what's in the materials, not for being an expert in any particular area. So. If you wanna teach building financial wellness and you don't know tons about financial education, you would listen to the podcast, watch the how-to webinar, which is about how to teach it to other people. Then you'd make sure you've read all of the materials, the participant guide and the teacher guide. And we recommend that you teach a class or two um, to some unsuspecting audience, maybe your family or um, other people in your program that are, are willing to see a not yet ready for prime time version. And if you're teaching it and people start asking questions that are outside your area of expertise, you feel perfectly okay to say, hey, I'm not a financial expert. I know the things in this curriculum, um, but I can't answer all your questions about this. So what's right. this reminds me a little bit. I know this isn't medical culture at all. In fact, it's the most empowering peer driven idea ever. But in medical culture, they have a thing called see one, do one, teach one. So you watch somebody do something, then you actually are supposed to do it, which always terrified me. And then you're supposed to teach someone else on how to do it. And your idea is you really engage people in a very fundamental way is the idea that the teacher also learns as we go, because that is another phenomena, right? You're helping others, therefore you learn as you do it. Yes, absolutely. I think you've put your uh, finger right on it, Ken. Um, and I think that's what's important about feeling empowered to use the suite. Um, and if you, let's say, are a certified uh, peer specialist, you have the training in how to talk to people, how to lead groups. You've got the basic ingredients required to go to the solution suite, look for some products that you're interested in um, offering, maybe at your peer run program, um, using them yourself first, um, and then watching the training webinar and the podcast and practicing teaching them to others. So excellent question. Are there any other questions? that uh, would be helpful for people to have answered at this part of the presentation? We're gonna save them for later, but okay. thank you. You answer the okay. questions that have come up so far. Thank you. Okay, that sounds good. So another solution suite product for people who are working or looking for work is called Physical Wellness for Work. This workbook teaches people about the importance of individual health habits and how those health habits combine to create routines that support holding a job.
For example, one section of the manual focuses on the importance of getting adequate sleep and rest, connecting these health routines to the ability to be productive at work, to staying awake and being alert throughout the workday, and to having the energy needed in order to get a job done. Another section educates people about the importance of healthy eating. See if I can get to that slide. There we go. Um, and various ways that practicing good nutrition can impact job performance. People learn about foods that fuel their body and mind so they can do their jobs. They reflect on the importance of healthy eating throughout the workday. So this includes things like not skipping lunch because you're busy and not using sugar or caffeine in the middle of the afternoon when you're starting to drag and feel tired. Other topics include stress management to handle workplace stressors like evaluation time or deadlines, physical activity to promote the stamina required for most jobs, um, and many folks don't have the stamina needed for the kinds of jobs they'd like to hold, and engaging in recommended health screening and medical care to keep you healthy and avoid those unpaid sick days. It's a health promotion approach geared toward work. It can also be paired with employment services and used by people who have worked for a while but want to feel better on the job. This is another one that you could use on your own, but you could also teach as a group. We've heard a lot about in the past two decades about the importance of integrating behavioral health and primary care. We have a number of resources in that area, and two of them focus on prevalent medical conditions that people with serious mental illness and substance use problems encounter, namely obesity and diabetes. So the first product is a weight management program called Nutrition and Exercise for Wellness and Recovery, or NUR. It's an eight week curriculum to help people lose weight through nutritious meal planning, reduce portion sizes, and increase daily physical activity, which by the way, can include dancing. It uses smart goal planning to help people set small achievable goals in a short period of time, along with peer support and a focus on intentionality to help participants stay on track. There's a leader manual and a participant workbook. Here's a segment on the importance of eating whole foods rather than processed foods. It teaches participants that as you move from eating an apple to eating applesauce to eating an apple Pop-Tart, you lose nutritional value and add unhealthy ingredients like sugar. There's a segment on reading food labels that participants really enjoy. Here, people learn what information is contained in different parts of the label how to read and make sense of this information. And as part of this segment, people are asked to bring in labels from their favorite foods so they can discover how nutritious they are, what portion sizes they actually refer to, and other important information they can use to make good food choices. Helping people read nutrition labels turns out to be a major, major thing um, for folks that are trying to manage their weight. Another fun feature of this tool is the accompanying exercise videos. There are nine of these videos featuring occupational therapy grad students and people in recovery working out together. This workout session occurs during the last 20 minutes of every class, and everyone is encouraged to participate regardless of any physical limitations they might have. For example, people who have difficulty standing are encouraged to exercise seated. And the videos include a person doing the activity from a chair, or in this case, on the floor. This segment of the class is key because not only do participants build stamina over eight weeks, and people are surprised at how much stronger they feel. Many also notice that they feel more positive and have more energy. Um, and I hope you're all familiar with the research showing that um, physical activity and exercise lowers feelings of depression, for example. So having these immediate benefits from uh, exercise through these videos motivates people to keep attending and to continue what they've learned after the class is over. Another product I'd like to highlight is our online interactive diabetes education toolkit. 
I mentioned that certain medical conditions are likely to be affecting people in recovery, and one of these is diabetes. We created a toolkit for many different actors. One is people with diabetes. The other is their medical providers who often aren't using the right kinds of materials to provide diabetes education that people can understand. Another is behavioral health care providers, uh, many of whom feel overwhelmed if they're working with someone with diabetes because they don't understand it and um, it's difficult to fathom the information. But this toolkit is also used a lot by family members and other supporters. The toolkit includes an extensive library of one-page information sheets written at grade school level, covering the basics of diabetes, how to build and maintain a healthy lifestyle to manage diabetes, and recommended medical tests. This last part is really important. The American Diabetes Association publishes standards for good diabetes care. And these standards are something everyone with diabetes needs to know to make sure they get the right tests and the right exams. Um, a foot exam, for example, and a dilated eye exam are two exams that are um, required at least annually um, if you're adhering to the American Diabetes Association standards of care. So all of the library materials are available in English and Spanish. So these care standards include a number of laboratory and other medical tests. People use the toolkit to learn what these tests measure and how to interpret their test results. Then, based on those results, they're linked directly to information sheets from the library with specific strategies for managing the various risks of diabetes. So here's a look at the page on A1C. And if I have just gotten my results from my doctor and know my A1C is nine, one of the first things I learn is that this is considered elevated. Um, I also look to the right at the library um, suggestions and I see I can read one that is entitled Understanding A1C. So I can learn a little bit more about what this number means. Um, I might also decide uh, that I wanna understand why I'm taking certain medications. And so I might open up the Why Treat Diabetes um, handout. So what's important about the way the toolkit is organized is that everything is linked. You learn about what the standards of diabetes care are. Then you click on a standard and um, if the standard is that A1C should be done once or twice a year, depending on your, your status, and you come to this page, and then you say to yourself, hmm, um, I really need to understand this better. And you go off to the library to read more. And what you're reading is written um, at a level where you don't have to be a doctor or a nurse in order to understand it and comprehend it. And if you yourself are a Spanish speaker or you're working with people that speak Spanish, there are Spanish language versions available. Um, we're proud about this toolkit. We love that it's online and interactive, and it was recognized as a quality tool by the AHRQ, and it's featured in their Healthcare Innovations Exchange. So check it out if you have or you work with someone with diabetes. We also have a detailed health fair planning manual that gives you step-by-step -step instructions for working in lo local outpatient mental health programs and their surrounding communities to conduct health screenings. This is a great project for NAMI affiliates. These screenings address the major chronic illnesses that occur with serious mental illness, including high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes and obesity, as I've mentioned already, and heart disease. Users are encouraged to start small, perhaps setting up a blood pressure screening event uh, one morning of a particular week. And then if they decide they want to go larger, they can build up to a full health fair with multiple screening stations and free health and wellness resources. A useful feature of this manual is that users are taken step by step through all the activities necessary to plan and conduct a successful health fair. This includes instructions for welcoming participants, making them feel comfortable, and letting them know what screening stations they can go to. This is really important. Uh, people in recovery don't often feel comfortable going to regular 
community health screenings. Uh, many of them um, know that they're overweight or obese and feel embarrassed to go to the health screening on BMI. Some um, don't feel healthy and are afraid that they might have something like diabetes or high blood pressure. And so they approach a regular health screening with trepidation. What our manual does is help you design a health screening that is welcoming to people. Uh, many of the people who staff your health screening, we recommend, should be peers and also family members who understand what it's like to come to a health screening if you don't feel in total control of your health. Also included in the manual are instructions for people staffing each station on how to administer the test. This includes explaining what the test is for, how to conduct it, how to record the results, and how to tell people what the result is and what that means. Here's an example from the blood pressure station. And again, if you just want to have um, uh, a blood pressure screening, maybe you want to invite the uh, local, there's a college or university in your local area, uh, maybe the nursing department would team up with you. But even if you don't have nurses to do blood pressures, this manual tells you what you need to do in order to administer them reliably and share with people the results of um, their screening and what those results mean. By giving a timeline template for all the different stages and steps of a health fair, it breaks down a very complex event into a manageable process. Here you learn that for a health fair to be held in early October, for example, you'll need to begin planning in March, form subcommittees in April, finalize what screening tests you'll do at each station in June, begin advertising in July, and finalize transportation and parking plans in September. We created this manual with our colleagues at Community Support Programs of New Jersey, uh, that Puron organization that I mentioned earlier. We held health fairs with them in four states. They've done many, many health fairs. Our research on these fairs found that participants showed significant increases in health locus of control and in their level of confidence of their ability to manage their own health. So the health screening participants change in terms of feeling more empowered to use the information they learn. But also equally important, our health screening of over 450 people also identified 82 instances of undiagnosed diabetes, hypertension, or high cholesterol. Getting their results immediately allowed these people to become aware of potentially serious conditions and make plans to see their healthcare providers as soon as possible. So that's our health fair manual. One of the most important parts of dealing with major behavioral health issues is being able to self-direct your services and increasing the amount of self-determination you have as you recover. A number of approaches have been shown to enhance self-determination, including motivational interviewing and person-centered planning. The suite contains a series of products that use these strategies. The first is a short workbook that allows users to assess the amount of self-determination they have in different life areas called Express Yourself. This is an assessment that people can complete on their own. They can do it with a service provider. They can do it with peers and in a peer group, family members, or other supporters. It familiarizes people with the notion of self-determination and the fact that it's a basic human right. Many people in recovery don't realize that self-determination is something that they deserve. Also, it guides them to rate how much self-determination they have in a number of different life areas that have been shown to be important to folks, like residential, community participation, transportation, coping with trauma, having friends, sexual expression, citizenship, and mental and physical health. Whoops, I went in the wrong direction there. Here, you'll see some of the statements people read about different life areas. These include things like, I choose where I work, and my basic human rights are respected and I have the final say over how I spend my money. Users first put a check next to areas where they have little choice and control. 
Next, they're instructed to go back and look at the areas they've checked and decide whether that area really matters to them. Just because you have low self-determination in a life area doesn't mean that area is all that important to you. But if it is important, they put a second check mark next to the statement. In the example on this page, the user put two check marks next to, I can choose where I live, indicating low self-determination in an area of high importance. Once people have identified which areas are important to them, they move on to the final section of the assessment. In this section, the statements are repeated, but this time under each is a link to one or two websites with useful information about that life area. Here we see a person who put two check marks next to the statement, I decide whether to live alone or with someone else. This turns out to be a really important thing in people's lives. Many people are living in group homes or supervised apartments where they're forced to have a roommate and it's not really a choice for them. So if the individual checked that statement twice and clicks on the link under it, they go to this website. Here, they find information designed to help them decide whether they want to have a roommate or not. They're asked to consider whether they're the kind of person who craves solitude and prefers being alone. They're asked if they like to share things like living spaces and kitchen items. They also think about whether they could use help from other people with life's daily chores. Also, whether they're good at dealing with people if conflicts arise. Access to this kind of information allows people to put their proverbial toe in the water and see whether this might be an area where they'd like to work towards some changes. If the user is working with a paper version of the assessment but has computer access, they can type the web link into their browser and go to the websites that way. And if they don't have internet access and are using the paper version, the person who is helping them use the tool can print out pages from the relevant website to read and discuss. After completing the assessment, people are encouraged to share the results with whomever they like, including family members and other supporters. The second tool in this self-determination series is a person-centered planning guide called This Is Your Life. It's a self-guided workbook that can also be used in group settings and also can be used by a client and a therapist or a family member with a relative. Person-centered planning helps people identify their personal strengths, preferences, goals, needs, and most importantly, how they would like their life to be. So it's not about treatment planning and recovering, it's about what kind of life you wanna to move toward. Using the stages of change model, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, I hope, um, users are guided through a planning process based on whether they're contemplating change, preparing for change, ready to act, or making changes already, but wanting to maintain their progress. It's not such a good manual to use if you're in the pre-contemplation phase where you're not even thinking yet about making changes. One of the strategies used in this tool is smart goal setting. Remember I mentioned that um, the solution suite tools use a number of clinical strategies and smart goal setting is one of these. Smart goals are based on the idea that we benefit from structure and accountability to achieve our goals. In smart goal formulation, it's important to write goals positively, what we will do, not negatively, what we'll stop doing. Sometimes we think we can't change, but really that's because we haven't formulated our goals in a way that helps us achieve them. The SMART goal setting process can provide a roadmap for people in order to make the journey. By now, I'm sure you realize that Express Yourself and This Is Your Life are somewhat parallel tools. Both are designed to encourage people to start believing that there's more to life than their illness and that they can set a goal and reach it even if they run into roadblocks. Express yourself as a little bit of a lighter touch um, and it involves using normalized re resources that are available um, through the World Wide Web versus um, clinical resources. This is your life is a little more involved, uses more clinical strategies 
and helps people set goals and be able to assess whether they're making progress toward those goals um, or whether they want to change them. We also recognize the importance of culturally specific and culturally competent services and supports, including peer support. We now have a whole science of how to enhance cultural competence in behavioral health. Our suite contains a product we developed in partnership with NAMI called the Cultural Competency Guidebook. We designed it in collaboration with the NAMI Star Center, and it's designed for use by peer-run programs and peer-run self-help support groups but it's also been used by all kinds of mental health programs. What's interesting about this manual is that we pilot tested it with seven peer run programs in Arizona, California, Oregon, Texas, Wisconsin, and Hawaii. And we use their ideas and experiences throughout the manual. It starts by introducing, introducing people to five organizational areas that reflect a program's cultural competency. These include its administration, policies and procedures that it follows, the staff at all levels who run the organization or who volunteer, the services and supports that it delivers, the program environments in which services are received, and the nature of communication and language capacity of the organization, including whether translation and interpretation services are available, for example. After understanding the importance of cultural competency in each of these areas, the user learns where to look in their program to see if it reflects cultural competence. In the area of program and group environment, you're going to look at how people are depicted in your program's brochures and other documents, whether the music and food offered at any meals or celebrations represents all the cultures of people who attend your program and whether the people who staff and attend your program represent the community that surrounds it, an important thing. In order to do an objective assessment of each program area, the manual provides a set of competency criteria that are specific to that area. Here are the criteria for rating the program's cultural competence regarding the staff and volunteers who provide services and supports. When rating your program in this area, You'll consider things like whether they receive cultural competency training and whether staff and volunteers are evaluated for their ability to work with diverse groups. You'll also look at whether your staff are racially and culturally diverse and whether your recruitment and hiring processes or uh, recruitment of volunteers encourages applications from people of diverse cultures. After rating each of the five organizational areas, the user develops a plan to increase the organization's cultural competency in areas where it's low. The manual provides bright ideas and things to try based on what other peer programs put in their plans in our pilot test. This page from the manual offers ideas about what to put in a plan for enhancing the program's physical environment, including multicultural artwork um, and a map marked with the countries of origin of staff and members. Finally, there's a section of the manual on how to evaluate the success of your plan and continually assess and improve your organization or support group. In our national pilot test, peer run programs in multiple states were able to use the guide to conduct assessments and make organizational plans. We followed them up after three months, which isn't a lot of time, but they showed demonstrable improvement in the organizational areas they targeted in their plans. So it is possible to get started and to take a, a tough area that involves a lot of soul searching um, and uh, potential for organizational change um, and begin to move forward in enhancing competency. So far, if you're still with me, I've introduced you to 10 of the suite's products. Amazing, huh? I'm going to mention the remaining ones um, in a lot less detail in case you wanna ask them about them during our discussion. We have a publicly available version of the evidence-based practice wrap. This was written by Dr. Mary Ellen Copeland and this freely publicly available version takes you through all the steps of developing your own wrap plan. 
It's a good introduction to RAP for people who aren't ready to participate in a RAP group, and also for programs and systems not yet using RAP, but wanting to know more about it. We strongly recommend that organizations wanting to implement RAP groups receive training from the Copeland Center and purchase RAP materials from RAP's publisher, Advocates for Human Potential. Another product is Whole Health Action Management, or WAM for short. WAM was developed by peer leader Larry Fricks and the Georgia Mental Health Network. It's designed to be taught by peers, um, but it can be taught by people who aren't peers. In WAM, people learn about 10 evidence-based health and resiliency practices, including restful sleep, healthy eating, cognitive skills to avoid negative thinking, and the benefits of service to others. Mental health peer support is provided through weekly WAM support groups at which people set and pursue goals by developing and following weekly action plans. They also meet individually with their WAM peer coach. We conducted a study of WAM, a randomized control trial, so a very rigorous study, and found that compared to people in the control condition, WAM participants had better physical health, greater hopefulness, and higher levels of feeling activated to manage their physical health and interact with medical providers. We also have a workbook called Journaling, a wellness tool. Don't know if you know much about journaling, but it's a practice that can offer a safe, cathartic release for dealing with the stresses of daily life. It can also stimulate artistic creativity. A number of studies have shown that journaling has both health and mental health benefits. So this workbook is definitely worth checking out. We have a guidebook for staying healthy following a psychiatric inpatient admission called Keeping Healthy After the Hospital that was developed by the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation Office of Behavioral Health. We have a health passport, which is a portable health record that people can use to understand and keep a, a record of their health tests, such as their blood pressure readings, their cholesterol levels, their A1C, and other health tests. We use this with people during our um, health fairs. Uh, but having the health passport alone to have a portable health record can be helpful aside from a health fail. We have a wellness activities manual. This introduces people to um, different types of wellness activities that they might want to learn about, get a little bit of a feel for before they decide to um, pursue them further. So there's an introduction to yoga and some simple yoga exercises. They're mindfulness exercises that people can try to see if that's an area that they'd like to learn more about. And also um, body relaxation techniques that people can experience. We have a brief guide called Raising Difficult Issues with Your Service Provider. This is designed to help people bring up sensitive topics and maybe give some negative feedback to clinicians in a positive way in a way that um, their opinions as, as service recipients will be listened to um, and respected. This is a, a popular manual, a very simple one, and what it basically provides are conversation openers to um, introduce topics that can be a little tough for clients to bring up with their service providers. And finally, we have a self-directed care implementation model, manual sorry, that tells you how to set up and run a program in which people have um, access to the self-directed care model. I don't know if you're familiar with that model, but that's one in which people have individual budgets from which they can purchase their goods and services for their recovery. We want to encourage everyone to use the products in our solution suite. Otherwise, we wouldn't be making them available for free um, and providing easy to access training and technical assistance. But please note that all materials are copyrighted. You're free to reproduce Solution Suite products for your own personal use or for use in your publicly funded program or support group. However, you're not permitted to reproduce, modify, or use Solution Suite products for commercial reasons or for research or educational purchase purposes um, without our written permission. And you also cannot include them in your own publications, including self-publications, without written permission from us. For those of you who would like to explore further, 
Here's a link at the top to the solution suite, the top page where um, you uh, learn about the two different types of solution suite materials. Our center's website, which has many, many other resources on it in addition to the solution suite. And then finally, our Twitter feed. You don't have to join Twitter to view the feed, but we do announce all of our new products on Twitter as well as related webinars and other activities. So, for example, yesterday I announced this webinar on Twitter um, and gave people the link that they could go to to sign up for it. You're going to want to um, remain apprised of the Solution Suite products. We're getting ready to uh, release a brand new manual on how to achieve and maintain your immune health. Um, and that clearly in these times of COVID uh, is an important um, health and wellness skill that everyone wants to have, have. Finally, here's my contact information. Feel free to send me an email. Uh, don't call me at that number, it's my office and we're all working from home right now, uh, but I will respond to your email. Um, and don't forget that you can, for each of the Solution Suite products, press that technical assistance button and you'll be put in contact with someone from my center who will help answer your questions, help you um, design a training program where you can train other people to use the Solution Suite um, product, and in some cases can enable you to correspond directly with the person who created the Solution Suite product that you'd like to use. So I'm gonna turn it back to Ken um, for the questions and answer segment of today's webinar. What a great talk, and I just wanna shout out, you're giving your email out and making it clear that you are here to help people. So it's a beautiful gesture. And, uh, you know, I just wanna uh, just acknowledge that. All right, the first question, uh, is this really free? That is the first question. So we have to say it again, because not everybody's had that experience. Yes, it's really free in the sense that you do not have to pay us to use these tools. Um, Nothing is really free though. So I do want to acknowledge that, you know, you need to have a computer in order to download it. Although if you don't have computer access um, and you've been able to learn about a tool, if you contact us, you can call us or you can um, email us. We will send you a paper copy, a bound paper copy of the tool. Um, we realize that not everybody's lucky enough to have the computers and internet access that we're all using today to access the webinar. But yes, these things are free. There are two products on there that um, the creators have allowed us, and this is Wrap and Wham, um, to have versions on so that you can get familiar with them. Uh, but we really do uh, recommend that you get training and get certified to deliver them to other people. And that does cost money. But aside from that, uh, um, insofar as things are really free, um, they're free for you to use and use with So the people. resources are all free. A person asks they want to become a trainer. So what is entailed in becoming a trainer to teach others? Well, so I'm assuming this is a person who wants, first of all, to um, learn how to use the tool themselves. Yep. So in order to be able to do that, you're going to want to listen to the podcast you're going to want to watch the training video. You're going to want to become very, very familiar with whatever it is that you would like to use with other people. Um, if you want to use the uh, diabetes toolkit with other people, you better have visited every single page on that toolkit and read it um, and made sure you understand it. Um, and so we suggest that if, before you train other trainers, you also deliver it um, to uh, people. If you're leading a group or a class, let's say, we recommend two or three classes before you train other people. Because it's in teaching those classes, you're gonna come up, you're gonna come up against some of the issues that you'll need to prepare your training. Uh, question, I'm a caregiver. Can I use these resources? You certainly can. They were designed for you. They were designed um, to uh, use with uh, the person that you care for. Um, make sure that person really wants to use the resource with you. Um, and I will tell you, I have, um, th there was one group of uh, caregivers. Um, they were older um, women and men who were caring for a family member um, who was elderly and they used the self-determination manual 
in order to see how much self-determination was left in their lives and whether they could enhance that a little bit. Because sometimes being mm. a caregiver, you end up giving up a lot of self-determination to right. your peer, that your person. I wanted to talk about, you know, the cardiac risk reduction idea, diabetes education. You mentioned a number of people that have been helped with that. Could you develop that a little more? Because I've had many people tell me over the years that they didn't fully appreciate or weren't told about the cardiovascular diabetes and metabolic risks associated with their antipsychotic meds, for example. So that is so very, very in, uh, important. Um, and, you know, health, the health fairs are a kind of a community active approach. Um, rather than telling people you might have diabetes or you look obese or you might have high cholesterol because of the way you eat and what your weight is, um, being able to go out and do a health fair that's comfortable and welcoming to people and perform these tests, which I'm a sociologist. I can do a um, uh, uh, A1C, for example. It's not as hard as you think it is. And particularly if you team up with a nursing department or med school, mm -hmm. um, you can actually take health assessment out into the community and capture these undiagnosed conditions. Um, otherwise, using the various solution suite tools to educate people about the fact um, that they could develop heart disease if they um, don't change mm -hmm. their eating habits or um, their exercise routine. Um, you know, one really important thing about physical activity is, you know, we talk about exercise and a lot of people don't want to exercise, particularly if they're obese. It's not very comfortable to engage in physical activity. So we teach about the fact that you can dance, um, you can take a simple walk. Uh, you don't have to go to a gym. You don't have to engage in an exercise right. routine. So these are some ways I think you can move people forward in their understanding of these co-occurring mm -hmm. conditions and starting to change their lifestyle in order to address them. Mm, excellent. Uh, what are you working on next? Ah, thank you for that question. Well. Um, you probably wrote this question before I told you all about the um, uh, manual for boosting your immunity system. So that's going to be the next one. Yeah, well, let's develop that a little bit. How <laughs> are you thinking about that? That is quite topical. How long might it take to create it? Um, do you have anything to share about it now? Because immunity is a source of some interest just now. It sure is. And of course, immunity is implicated not just in COVID, but in um, many of the chronic illnesses that people face. Um, one of the big challenges of the immunity manual was um, filtering out all the junk science that's out there about immunity. Yes. And really focusing on um, uh, ways to boost your immunity um, that have some kind of scientific basis behind them. So we worked with mm -hmm. doctors and nurses uh, to make sure we weren't saying blanket things like take vitamin C, it's good for everyone under every circumstance. Right. Um, so uh, I think that that's an important lesson. It's taken us about a year to get it ready. Um, okay. And the final version is being reviewed by our doctors who have very high standards of evidence. Um, and we're hoping that it will be ready for release in um, September or maybe October at the latest. I just want to tell people if you're interested in, you know, vaccines and vaccine information, we did an Ask the Expert with a couple of um, infectious disease physician experts in about January or February. So we developed the whole history of racism, institutional problems, the reason people might be skeptical, and then we just went through the whole science. and. I would encourage you to do that if you're interested in this topic. Um, all right, that's very helpful. That's very helpful. Um, let's talk a little bit about money. Um, most people don't take on money as part of a recovery concept. What led you to that? Um, I agree it's important. And uh, it's interesting because I haven't really heard anybody develop that as an idea. So you mentioned money, money management, um, where'd that come from? So for our center, um, if you're familiar with our center, you know we've done a lot of research on employment um, and valid evidence-based ways to help people enter the job market and, and develop their careers. And one of the things that we noticed was that it's one thing to help someone get a job and earn some money. It's an, 
another thing to know exactly what to do with that money, how to manage it well. Um, many of the people that we heard from had representative payees, so they were really not in charge of their own money. Yeah. Um, and so what we realized was that um, basic financial education was needed. Um, we also learned that a lot of people worry a lot about money, um, have very bad feelings about themselves. Money is a big contentious issue, often between yes. individuals and their families. Um, so uh, this is one of the reasons that we've had a, a, a financial education uh, class available from our center for 20 years now. Um, but this one has just been developed with Peggy Swarbrick and Pat Nemec. Uh, we've pilot tested it. We think it's our best one yet. That's great. That's a very helpful, very creative. So really, it really covers the waterfront. The suite really covers the waterfront. Do you find uh, that people are in a fairly advanced stage of recovery when they're using the suite? Uh, you know, this gets to the idea of the stages of change. When do you catch people along the continuum? Are they in active contemplation? Are they in early action? Are they in action? Are they in relapse prevention? Where on the spectrum do you find people who access these resources are? So that's a really important question. Um, and one group that doesn't access it so much, but the people that work with them could access it, are people in pre-contemplation. Uh, mm -hmm. Many, many folks are, are stuck and they are not even beginning to think about change. And if you know the stages of change, the strategy you use um, at that stage is um, educating people and trying to raise their consciousness, not trying to suggest that they should change, um, but suggesting that other people have encountered similar problems to them and that there are um, ways to address some of their problems, again, not in terms of them. So some people use the solution suite um, tools for consciousness raising with folks, gives them ideas about how they mm. can bring these, you know, into fruition. People who are contemplating change in that contemplation stage um, often will check into a tool. Um, you know, we try to direct them toward the lighter touch tools um, so that they're not overwhelmed and, mm. and they, you know, try a tool and go, wow, this wasn't bad. It was actually kind of fun. And look, I'm going to real uh, websites that anybody could access. Um, people that are ready to change and trying to maintain changes, a lot of them use the solutions. Mm -hmm. And it. as you know, many people that are pretty far along in their recovery have become peer specialists. They're leading um, not yes. only peer-to-peer uh, -peer support groups um, or uh, support groups for family members. And so they come back to the suite um, to, to retool and learn, learn new things they could try. Excellent. Well, I just want to say this was a great talk. It's incredible what you've put together and what you're continuing uh, to put together. Um, I just want to thank you. And I want to thank you again for making yourself available to the community of about 170 people that attended this uh, session. Wow, and we'll, that's wonderful. We'll, and we'll hear it, uh, you know, it lives on NAMI, uh, on uh, SE Expert on the website. Uh, so could we advance the slide? Um, I want to acknowledge our incredible team here at NAMI that does all the heavy lifting. This is Dr. Terry Brister, Jesse Walthall, Jordan Miller, um, and uh, we put these webinars together uh, trying to get the best ideas to you. Uh, we have a couple remarkable ones coming up. Dr. Christine Moutier, the Medical Director of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Uh, that is a September concern, and we're very fortunate to have her. Uh, in recovery uh, thinking uh, along the work of Dr. Cook, uh, we'll be having the Me Too Orchestra. And uh, they are people with lived experience who formed uh, several high performance orchestras. And there's an excellent documentary. So we'll have some combination of the people who ran the documentary, uh, the conductor who is brilliant, the executive director, and some of the individuals. So that'll be a musical one. Uh, with people with lived experience uh, as experts. So those are two to look for. Remember, you are not alone. Obviously, we're, we're good, but we're not that good. We're not giving medical advice or clinical advice. We're trying to give information and resources to people. Uh, it should be noted that NAMI likes donations, and we um, you know, are a nonprofit that like um, people to donate to us. Um, 
Uh, how about the next slide? Is that is the last slide? Well, I've done my best to cover for our CEO, Dan Gillison. Um, and I just want to thank you all for attending. Dr. Cook, thank you for everything you do. And I hope everybody has a great uh, rest of their week. And I look forward to seeing you in September for Dr. Christine Moutier, uh, who is also a national treasure. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening.